da 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 Uh, but in America, no, it's not. It's just one day. Um, and uh, in this case, we actually have a month, a, a, a national month, uh, and that's African uh, American history or, or Black history, uh, however you want you choose to uh, call it. Um, both is are fair. And a Black History Month, it, it's an important month to uh, recognize uh, important cultural uh, contributions. To America from people who who don't really get to have their their voice and that's uh, people uh, uh, of black or african-american heritage and um, yeah and just want to give give them their voice in the last year I did a stream or not last year but the year before that I did a stream talking about you know important people in in, uh, in American history who are people of color and, and I thought I'd do it again this year, but I'm going to do something a little bit different. Uh, for the next three streams, this stream and then the future streams for this month, I'm combining historical figures with romance. Huh? How do you like that? How do you like that? <laughs> and and I thought what I would do is um, almost almost all of the people that I chose are connected to music in some way. Uh, because there's nothing more romantic than a love song, right? Um, but there, but there are a couple of musicians that I'm including who are also very accomplished actors. I'm including, so they're both singers and actors, very talented people, basically. But my first person that I'm going to introduce, I'm going to do it right now. I'm going to start introducing this person right away. So let's get into it. Yeah. Um. Here we go. Happy Valentine's Day, everybody. <laughs> and I just thought I'd talk a little bit about uh, uh, this this really important person in uh, in American history, Billie Holiday, who um, she was also her, her nickname was Lady Day, and she is one of my all time favorite uh, singers. Uh, she is, uh, her genre of music is jazz, and she was uh, very influential to the modern jazz sound. Uh, so you have to think about, uh, in American music history, jazz, jazz or originally came out of uh, the American South, New Orleans, and that area, um, as an expression of from the African Americans, the black people from the from those communities. And jazz as it is is kind of an interpretive style of music. There's no one right way to play it except to feel it, really. And the thing about Billie Holiday is she came when a lot of the musicians had more or less nailed down the sound, jazz sound. And she was she was brought up, she grew up in that in that life and that artistic musical community. And her singing, the what she brought to jazz is kind of a, 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 for lack of a better term, a sweetness and an eloquence. So those, are, those are good adjectives to, to, to use to talk about music and singing. So who was she? Well, um, my understanding is she was born in New York. She was not born in the American South, although she did spend some time there. But she was born and she was raised, and while she did travel around in her early years, really she started her musical career in jazz clubs, jazz cafes, at a very, very young age. Like a very, she was very young, but she could pass as very mature, right? She was, I think she was 15 
when she got her first paid performance at a, at a club in New York. Yeah, um, you know I've, you know when I when I taught I've I've had high school students who just seem to project a maturity and a self awareness to themselves that made them seem older than they really than they really were. And I and I wonder if Billie Holiday was the same. You know. Um but but she lived a very a very full life starting at a very young age and a very successful life. Yeah, well she yeah, she was one of the performers that really brought modern music, the modern sound to Carnegie Hall. Carnegie Hall was this at the time a relatively new uh, performance space music hall for that would play you know orchestral music and whatnot and it was it, she really elevated jazz to the point where it could be performed and enjoyed at Carnegie Hall in New York and this was obviously in the uh, in the late in the late 40s um, <clears throat> 1948 there you go 1948 I had to fact check myself uh, I like to, I, 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 I felt the need to do it because I want to do her justice. And uh, don't worry, I'm going to be editing a lot of this out. <laughs> uh, yeah, so Billie Holiday, like her, her prime was from mid, mid 30s until late 40s, uh, 1950. And I don't really want to talk about, you know, the end of her career. And then the end of her life because it's very sad. And what I want to do instead is I want to celebrate the romance aspect of Billie Holiday. So jazz was always this artistic expression. And especially in the 40s and eventually in the 50s, it became a kind of a popular genre. It's pop, pop music, really. And even then, it had evolved thanks in large part to Billie Holiday into modern jazz by then and it was like there was some kind of controversy you know some of the older folks thought hey that hey that jazz music is is going to influence the young people <laughs> or something like that I don't know what they were thinking um but also it, it had a, a a bit of a feeling of kind of like a an underground music you know it's like a is there's a democracy to jazz, especially jazz singing, singing about jazz. Uh, and yet here it was this very attractive woman with a very beautiful voice singing beautiful love songs uh, in the jazz genre. And that kind of, you know, that itself was controversial in that, you know, hey, you know, these people have these images, these expectations of what jazz is, and suddenly, that, that, that might be negative, then suddenly out of nowhere uh, comes this woman who you look at, you look at her, you look at this picture, and you, get, and you realize, wait a minute, this is not a dangerous person. And then the other aspect is, um, by this time, jazz music had been taken over by a class of people, upper class, uh, college educated, mostly white. So white privilege took over jazz mostly by this time. And the few black artists that were allowed to play you know, in movies and, and on the radio and sell records and play at Carnegie Hall were very few, very few. And they had to be accepted by the white community. And that's a problem um, because it's not allowing for black people to be who they are and to enjoy the benefits of their of their artistic expression on, by their own merit. They have at this time in American history, they had to be allowed in the music industry by white people. And. You could say that Billie Holiday, with her, with her very attractive looks, beautiful singing voice, and singing these love songs, um, just kind of paved the way, but also allowed her entrance into this very closed club 
of of you know the music industry, and allowed people from all over the world to be able to enjoy her music. In the only place where she could find real um, freedom to enjoy her music, uh, or not enjoy, but but perform her music, it tended to be overseas. You know, when when she was not in the U.S., when she was traveling Europe, and also parts of Canada as well. Uh, you know, you know, she was she was accepted as an equal. She was appreciated as an equal. Uh, she had fans of, of all races and classes who enjoyed her music. And the thing about you know vinyl records, which was the media at the time, in the radio, and she had overwhelming popularity through that because those were media that were democratic they couldn't be rich you can't restrict the airwaves by class if anything it's you know the radio was a classless and raceless device and uh again i mean i know i'm bringing up the, the race thing and i think it's an important conversation to have i'm going to be having this conversation uh, several times this month because i think it's an important one it is black history month in america but I I want to uh, I want to uh, uh, talk a little bit and then I'm going to end uh, this part of the stream uh, with the romantic aspect of Billie Holiday. You'll note that I did not play any music. Uh, I did have uh, Billy Billy Holiday music that is in the Creative co Copyright domain, but I don't trust the streaming platform to mute or not allow you know, the music on this stream. So I'm, I'm not going to play any of our music, which is unfortunate. It really is unfortunate that I can't play interview music because I want to introduce you to her music. Um, it, she, was a, she was a wonderful singer. Uh, so what I encourage you to do is after you watch this stream, uh, do a search for Bailey Holiday. Find a YouTube video. Or go to YouTube Music. Um, that is a separate platform. It's not within YouTube. It's a whole separate music or, or streaming platform that is owned by YouTube. So it's YouTube Music. You got to look for that. It, it looks a lot like your Spotify, um, Tidal, and all of those platforms. It looks very similar to to that. And just do a search for Billy Holiday. Uh, yeah, and listen, do a listen. That's your homework. That's your homework. I want you to listen to Bailey Holiday and get an appreciation for just you know, how romantic that music is. Um, if, if I'm on a date, oh my goodness, I will be playing Bailey Holiday. If I want to get in a romantic mood, you know, you know, I'm I'm at home and I just want to feel a bit of romance in the air. I'll I will absolutely put on Billie Holiday because she will put me in that mood. Um, I'm not gonna tell you individual songs. It's just there's just so so much uh, in her catalog uh, to to listen to. One of my earliest memories of Billie Holiday is. Um, this would have to be, I think this was in high school and one of my friends was kind of going through a jazz period. I was going through a, uh, um, a new, new wave, um, post punk period. Um, and of course my parents listened to jazz too. Um, you know, Dave Brubeck and, and all of that. Um, but one of my friends he really got into, you know, the jazz, the jazz of the 40s and 50s. And Billie Holiday came up and I was like, I'm just going to listen to this. <laughs> oh, and I remember my friend, he had it all on vinyl. He had it all on records. Like we, we had cassettes by then. Um yeah, yeah, yeah. I think we did. I think we had cassettes, but yeah, we definitely had kids cassettes by then. But no, he he could only find 
uh, quality recordings on on records, and so we had to dig out at his like his dad's or like his mom. I think it was his mom's record player, and set it up in his room. And his parents thought we were a bunch of weirdos, but as long as it was jazz and not that devil music or something like that, which is hilarious because, you know, at that time it'd be like you know forty forty years earlier, uh, sub jazz, especially jazz by people of color would have been considered the devil music and that's that's so funny i, I look i look back at it now and like you know jazz was controversial at the time like how can jazz be considered problematic today <laughs> it could be through a certain lens yeah so billy holiday um she was a controversial figure later in her life, but I don't want to reflect on that. What I want to do, do, say is uh, she definitely was an inspiration for the a romantic mode, if that's possible way to say. Um, sure, he had a lot of love songs in jazz, but Billie Holiday really made it apparent that jazz could be romantic music. And that start, it started a whole trend in music, the you know the romantic jazz uh, sort of interpretation, um, and if you listen to her, you you'll you'll get a sense of what I mean. I hope that you do, uh, because yeah. In in another thing, the thing is, I, I, the reason why I bring up that that memory that I have of of high school, listening uh, on my in my friend's bedroom on their record player, listening to Billie Holiday. Um, it was my first real awakening to what was romantic. And I'd always been kind of a romantic kid anyway. Like I love, I've always loved, always have loved a good love story. You know, the princess bride and all that gushy stuff. But like, I wouldn't go out of my way to like watch a rom-com or read a book that was primarily relationships. But because of this experience listening to Billie Holiday, I became a lot more comfortable doing that. You know, um, this is also an era when romance between characters was, was much more emphasized in media, um, especially in TV, books, comic books. You know, uh, before this time in comic books, you know, romance you know, the shipping angle in comics was where it was pretty shallow pretty shallow also family dynamics friendships you know they're pretty flat um but also around this time there was a a, you know, a more evolved more complex storytelling within the comic book industry um is the beginning of the graphic novel think about that and so my own real awakening to the possibilities of romance, what does it mean to be romantic? What does that mean to feel romance uh, on, a, on a very sustained and human level? Um, happened around this time. It was a whole kind of convergence of things. And Billie Holiday absolutely played a major part of all of this. So with that, I am going to move us along to the next segment, which is I'm going to play a game. So thank you very much. Next week is going to be more topics uh, about people who are I consider important romantic figures in black history.